Welcome to this third and final lecture in the series Publishing the Gospel, in which we've been looking at three of the best-selling evangelistic books of the 17th century and the profound impact they have had over the years. To refresh your memories, we started with Arthur Dent's The Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven, a groundbreaking work of 1601, which explained the way of salvation through a discussion between four characters. In the second lecture, we moved on to Richard Baxter's powerful little book, A Call to the Unconverted, first published in 1658, which had phenomenal sales in Baxter's lifetime and continued to be widely read and distributed for nearly two centuries. Today, we will be considering Joseph Allain's An Alarm to Unconverted Sinners, published initially in 1672 and almost always referred to as Elaine's Alarm. It too has had huge sales. Edmund Callamy wrote in 1702, 30 years after its first publication, multitudes will have cause ever to be thankful for it. No book in the English tongue, the Bible only excepted, can equal it for the number that has been dispersed. The alarm was soon translated into Welsh and German and became very popular in North America. It's still in print today with several Christian publishers and was one of the earliest titles reissued by the Banner of Truth after it was set up in the late 1950s. Between 1959 and 2002, Banner had sold almost 68,000 copies. But as Ian Murray then editor of the Trust, admits, Such is the climate among Christians today that these pages may serve primarily as an instrument to revive believers before they become a tool for evangelism. And the alarm should certainly challenge us to think more deeply about conversion and inspire us to be more zealous as we seek to reach the lost. The lecture will follow the same pattern as the previous two in the series, so that comparisons between the three books can be made. This is the outline of the lecture. 1. Setting the scene. This will be about the historical background to the book's publication. 2. A brief biography of the book's author, Joseph Allain. 3. The book itself under the headings why, who, how and what. Fourthly, the impact of the book on some of its readers. And fifthly, and finally, by way of conclusion, five lessons for us today from the alarm. So first, setting the scene, the historical background to the book's publication. Richard Baxter's Call to the Unconverted was published in 1658, the year of Oliver Cromwell's death. Only two years later, the monarchy, in the person of Charles II, was restored. And the period of religious freedom, which allowed the godly to worship in the way they desired, came to an end. The increasing persecution of those not willing to conform to the new demands of the Restoration Church of England in the 1660s will be the subject of next year's lectures, so I don't want to go into too much detail at this point. Suffice it to say, the alarm was written in this period by an author who was one of those forced out or ejected from the Church of England ministry in 1662. Only 14 years had elapsed since Baxter had published his call, but the background situation was now very different. And Richard Baxter was born nearly 20 years before Joseph Elaine, but outlived him by 23 years. 2. A brief biography of the book's author, Joseph Elaine, 1634 to 68. Much of what we know about Joseph Elaine's life comes from the biography written by his wife Theodosia after her husband's death and published in 1672. 
It has an introduction by Richard Baxter, with contributions from others who knew Elaine well. Joseph Elaine was born on the 8th of April, 1634, in Devizes, Wiltshire. His father, Toby Elaine, was a local clothier of the Puritan persuasion. Joseph was a child when the English Civil War broke out, and before he was 10 years old, he witnessed the clash of roundheads and cavaliers in the market square in Devizes, where his family lived. And although the king's forces were initially successful, two years later, the parliamentary army won control of Devizes and pulled down the castle in 1648. Joseph's eldest brother, Edward, already in the ministry, died in 1645, when Joseph was 11. By this time, Joseph was noted as a serious-minded boy. He was called the lad that will not play. And he'd already begun to run the Christian race, spending much time in private prayer. He begged his father that he might be educated to take his dead brother's place in the work of the ministry. And so in April 1649, age 15, Joseph went up to Lincoln College, Oxford University, to study for the ministry. And in Oxford at that time were such spiritual giants as John Owen and Thomas Goodwin. In 1651, Elaine moved to Corpus Christi College, which was known as a more thoroughgoing Puritan seminary. Elaine, a pious and diligent student, gained his BA in 1653, becoming a tutor and then chaplain to the college. His pleasant and cheerful disposition won him many friends, but he was so single-minded that he would never let their visits interrupt his studying time, saying that only a few will take notice of the rudeness, but many may feel the loss of my time. As a chaplain, he laboured to evangelise country villages around Oxford, and he also preached to prisoners in the jail every fortnight. And before Elaine was 21, it was said he had learnt to be, quotes, infinitely and insatiably greedy for the conversion of souls. And to this end, he poured out his very heart in prayer and in preaching. In 1655, Joseph was called to serve as assistant to the worthy Puritan minister, George Newton, at the parish church of St Mary Magdalene in Taunton, Somerset, after being ordained by the local presbytery. George Newton's summary of his new assistant was this. He had a good head and a better heart. In Taunton, a wool manufacturing town with a population of about 20,000, was a Puritan stronghold in the West Country, and it had suffered much during the Civil War years. Shortly after his move to Taunton, Joseph married his cousin Theodosia Alain, a very godly young woman, on the 4th of October 1655. And in her biography of him, Theodosia could find only one fault with which to chide her husband that he didn't spend enough time with her. He would reply, Ah, oh, my dear, I know thy soul is safe, but how many that are perishing have I to look after? Oh, that I could do more for them! When he was well, Theodosia wrote, he did rise constantly at or before four o'clock, and on the Sabbath sooner if he did wake, he would be much troubled if he heard any blacksmiths or shoemakers or such tradesmen at work at their trades before he was in his duties with God, saying to me after, Oh, how this noise shames me! Does not my master deserve more than theirs? From four till eight he spent in prayer, holy contemplation and singing of psalms, which he much delighted in and did daily practice alone as well as in his family. Joseph and Theodosia devoted themselves to the Lord's work in Taunton. Theodosia kept a school, while Joseph spent every weekday afternoon 
from about 2 till 7pm visiting his parishioners in their homes. He kept a list of the inhabitants of each street and systematically and tenderly catechised them all, including children and servants, in much the same way that Richard Baxter did in Kidderminster. Pressing on them, quotes, the absolute necessity of conversion. On the Lord's Day, his preaching was full of urgent pleas to the unconverted to repent. The Lord was pleased to bless us exceedingly in our endeavours, Theodosia reported, so that many were converted in a few years that were before strangers to God. George Newton, his fellow minister, recalled, his supplications and his exhortations many times were so affectionate, so full of holy zeal, life and vigour, that they quite overcame his hearers. He melted them and sometimes dissolved the hardest hearts. God freely poured grace into his lips and he freely poured it out. Ian Murray writes that even in an age when powerful preaching and successful evangelism were comparatively common, Elaine's ministry was outstanding in the eyes of his brethren. And in his love for souls, his winsome preaching and his holy life, Joseph Elaine is reminiscent of another young minister two centuries later who made a similar impact in his brief life, the Scot Robert Murray McShane. And what George Newton said of Elaine could also be said of McShane. His race was short and swift and his end glorious. However, the days when Elaine was at liberty to declare freely the truths of the gospel were limited. After Joseph had laboured for five years in Taunton, Charles II was restored and the religious situation of the country was completely changed. By the Act of Uniformity of 1662, about 2,000 godly ministers who could not subscribe to its demands were ejected from their pulpits. And Joseph Elaine and George Newton were among the 85 or so who suffered in this way in Somerset. And in next year's series, I hope to tell you more about some of those in Leicestershire and also refer in more detail to Elaine's experiences. However, although Elaine could no longer preach in the parish church, he refused to be silenced. He realised that his time might well be short and his love for the people spurred him on. He increased his preaching activity. In the next few months, he preached between six and 14 times each week to small groups. He also wrote letters to his fellow ejected ministers, urging them to continue preaching to their flocks. Finally, after surviving many threats, Elaine received a summons on the 26th of May, 1663. The following night, between 1 and 2 a.m., many hundreds of his people, young and old, gathered, and he preached and prayed with them for about three hours. The next day, as he set off for Ilchester Prison, the streets were lined on both sides by lamenting people. But Elaine remained cheerful and spoke encouraging words to them. He continued to praise God within the prison and to address crowds who gathered outside, as well as writing regular letters to his beloved congregation, urging them to stand firm. He often sat up all night praying, as that was the only private time that he had. Joseph was released after a year, but further government legislation tightened the screw on nonconformist ministers, limiting their activities even more. Elaine's health was declining, but he resumed preaching in secret until the 10th of July 1666, when the doors of the private house in which he was speaking were battered open and he was again taken off to prison. On his release, he still insisted on carrying on preaching. Now we have one day more, he would say to his wife as he rose in the morning. Here is one more day for God. Now let us live well this day. Work hard for our souls. 
lay up much treasure in heaven this day, for we have but a few to live. His thoughts turned to the possibility of missionary work in Wales or even in China. However, Elaine's constitution never recovered from the hardships of his confinements and the punishing regime he had set himself, and his body began to waste away, burnt out like a candle, it was said. And Joseph Elaine died on the 17th of November 1668 at the age of 34 in Bath. At his own request, his body was laid to rest in the chancel of St Mary Magdalene's Church in Taunton, where he had preached so fervently. His funeral sermon was delivered by the old George Newton. When the alarm to unconverted sinners was published in 1672, it was posthumously, almost four years after Elaine's death. Point three, the book itself an alarm to unconverted sinners. First of all, a few words of general introduction. Elaine's alarm is usually spoken of in association with Baxter's call, and people frequently read both books. And as they were only published 14 years apart and written by authors passionate about the conversion of souls, there are many similarities, as we shall see. Elaine and Baxter had a great admiration for each other's ministry, and it was to Baxter that Elaine's widow turned for advice about publishing her husband's manuscript after his death. Like Baxter's call, Elaine's alarm can be classified as a little book designed to be sold cheaply at around eight pence or one and sixpence bound. And the volume often included some of Elaine's letters or George Newton's funeral sermon for Elaine. This rebound copy of 1678 has some practical cases of conscience judiciously resolved by Elaine added at the end. And various people thought that the title of the book, An Alarm, might put off potential readers. So in some editions, the title was changed to the less threatening A Sure Guide to Heaven, rather reminiscent of Dent's of Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven, which sounds rather more appealing. Now, Edmund Calamy wrote in 1702, there have been 20,000 sold under the title of The Alarm and 50,000 of the same under the title of The Sure Guide to Heaven. 30,000 were sold at one impression. And for the same reasons, the Banner of Truth made a similar change of title, first publishing the book as Elaine's Alarm, but by 1999, issuing it as A Sure Guide to Heaven. The contents are exactly the same. The posthumous publication of the Alarm helped its sales. Theodosia's biography of Joseph Elaine established his reputation as a zealous young pastor suffering and dying for the sake of the gospel, and many were drawn to read his works. Baxter too promoted the book. And we heard last time about the formation of societies devoted to distributing gospel literature amongst the poor, and Elaine's alarm quickly became one of the favourite titles to be given away alongside the call. A man called Thomas Brand organised a scheme for the free distribution of the alarm. And at Brand's funeral, it was reported that he paid down £50 at first as a deposit, besides more afterwards for that impression of 20,000 copies to be dispersed through the Kingdom of England and Dominion of Wales. And I think I may say, there has been 20,000 more printed to be sold at reduced rates. The Society for Promoting Religious Knowledge Among the Poor, founded in 1750, reported that in the first 30 years of its existence, it had given away 10,172 copies of Elaine's Alarm. The book's popularity continued and editions published in 1782, 
1783 and 1785, specified that they were to be given away, not sold, obviously paid for by subscriptions of supporters. And we will now look at the book itself under four headings, why, who, how and what. First, why, Elaine's motives for writing the book. Perhaps because the alarm was published after his death, Joseph Elaine, unlike Richard Baxter, never explained explicitly why he wrote this book or in what circumstances. However, from all that we know about Joseph Elaine, from his life and his letters, it would be true to say that this book was written out of his passionate desire for the conversion of sinners. The dedication, printed on the frontispiece, declares, To all the ignorant, carnal and ungodly, who are lovers of pleasure more than God, and seek this world more than the life everlasting, and live after the flesh and not after the spirit, these calls and counsels are directed in the hope of their conversion to God and of their salvation. Second, who? Elaine's intended audience. And you might wonder why Elaine or his executors should feel the need to bring out the alarm in view of the broadly similar target audience to Baxter's call. Indeed, Elaine certainly would have been aware of the popularity of Baxter's treatise. But one explanation can be found in the populace's thirst for new reading material and a feeling among Elaine's godly friends that a fresh publication written by a different author might create a renewed interest in the subject of conversion amongst the unsaved. But the primary justification for the publication of the alarm can be found in the particular local target it envisaged. In the same way that Baxter's special evangelistic burden was for his own parishioners in Kidderminster, so the state of the people in Taunton was on Elaine's heart and mind as he wrote. But although there's no formal dedication to the population of Taunton in the alarm, it's clear from the original book itself that Elaine's own specific intention was to reach his parishioners in the town. Although in modern editions of the alarm, most local and personal references have been cut out. And addressing his readers as dearly beloved, whom I have been many a year wooing, Elaine declares, I must apply myself to you, to whom I am sent. God knoweth, you yourselves are my witnesses, how I have followed you in private as well as in public, and have brought the gospel to your doors, testifying to you the necessity of the new birth, and persuading you to look in time after a sound and thorough change. Have you not heard the same truths from the pulpit, by public labours, by private letters, by personal instructions? Elaine's prime concern was thus the conversion of his flock, whom he calls the beloved people, the inhabitants of the town of Taunton, in a letter on the same theme written from Ilchester Jail in July 1663. An ejection from his pulpit increased the urgency of Elaine's passion to win them for Christ, knowing that his time might be short. But Elaine obviously wants to address all sorts and ranks of people. His comprehensive description of the marks of the unconverted covers 22 categories, 10 of which cover the openly profane, while 12 relate to the hidden sins of the self-deceivers. And he addresses both servants at the lower end of the social spectrum, as well as rich oppressors at the upper end. However, most commonly we find him speaking to those somewhere in the middle, people involved in business or shopkeeping. And these sort of men were likely to be heads of families, perhaps the only one who could read in the household, and were responsible for the spiritual welfare of those living under their roof. If they failed, 
in the responsibility of having daily family worship. They were neglecting God's charge for the souls of their wives, children, servants and apprentices. Thirdly, how, the, the manner or style that Elaine uses. The difficulty, as always, was getting unbelievers past the first hurdle, picking up and then reading such a book. We've already seen how this concern resulted in an alternative title. And Richard Elaine, Theodosia's father, in his introductory um, epistle to the book, also recognises the problem of persuading people to read the contents, saying, Unconverted persons, how many there are, but how few unconverted readers, especially of such books as this before thee. A play or a romance better suits the lusts, and therefore must have more of the eye of such. How many are there to whom this is directed, who will not know that they are the men? And how little hope is there that this excellent treatise should reach its end with those who apprehend not themselves concerned in it? And like Baxter's call, Elaine's alarm reads much like a sermon addressed directly to the reader. You can almost hear Elaine's voice speaking to you. It's also like a personal letter from Elaine's soul to your soul. And this is, I think, probably the strongest feature of the book, the passionate sense of Elaine's love for God and sinners, including you personally, the reader. Elaine begins the alarm with the address, dearly beloved and longed for. And he continues in a tone of loving endearment, very similar to that of his published prison letters. Elaine sets out to convince and persuade his readers, using a combination of reason and emotion. He aims to change minds as well as hearts. And the Puritans often declared that they used a plain style of preaching and writing so that everyone could understand. Elaine waxes lyrical about this style. Brethren, I beseech you to suffer a friendly plainness and freedom with you in your deepest concernments. I am not playing the orator to make a learned speech to you, nor dressing my dish with eloquence wherewith to please you. I'm not baiting my hook with rhetoric, nor fishing for your applause, but for your souls. Joseph Elaine was a highly educated man who'd written a Latin treatise on philosophy. But in the alarm, he keeps his academic learning in check in order to reach the ordinary and simple folk. Elaine's prose style in the alarm is intense and vivid, full of earthy vernacular images and pithy aphorisms. Sin, an abomination to a holy God, is often portrayed as filth, putrefaction and disease. Elaine writes, God finds nothing in man to turn his heart, but to turn his stomach. Enough to provoke his loathing, nothing to provoke his love. But God and his ministers are presented as loving physicians or surgeons who can cure. When dealing with those who have false hopes of conversion, Elaine explains, I set about it as a surgeon when to cut off a putrid member from his well-beloved friend, which of course he must do, but with an aching heart, a pitiful eye and a trembling hand. Elaine uses a variety of ways to increase the impact of his message. He constantly makes direct appeals to his reader by piling up personal sometimes rhetorical questions. At the end of the treatise, he asks, Have you read hitherto and are not yet resolved upon a present abandoning of all your sins and closing with Jesus Christ? Alas, what shall I say? What shall I do? Have I run in vain? 
Another marked feature is the inclusion of several prayers of Elaine to God on behalf of those reading. And this serves to make the reader feel that a divine power is being enlisted in the campaign for his conversion. And Elaine was writing at a time when the devastation caused by the Great Fire of London in 1666 was still very fresh in people's minds. And he uses fiery images to bring home his message. How futile, he says, to battle against the devouring fire of hell, which burns 70 times seven more fierce than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. And this leads to the evocative metaphor. What thinkest thou, O man, of being a faggot in hell to all eternity? An alarm indeed. However, these grim warnings were not intended to create despair, but to alert the reader to the urgent necessity of action. Elaine writes, I would not trouble you nor torment you before the time with the forethoughts of your eternal misery, but in order to your making your escape. The brand can be plucked from the burning. The child can be pulled out of the flames. The sinner is urged to, quote, study thy misery till thy heart do cry out for Christ as earnestly as ever a drowning man did for a boat or the wounded for a surgeon. So what had begun as a call to the unconverted from the pen of Richard Baxter in the late 1650s had gained the added urgency of an alarm sounded by Joseph Elaine in the persecuting times of the 1660s. For what? This is a brief summary of the book's contents. And unlike Baxter, Elaine doesn't choose one specific biblical text to expound. Instead, he ranges far and wide in the scriptures, supporting all of his arguments with relevant texts. Elaine organises his material under seven headings, explaining the reasons for this in the introduction. Though the way of salvation through faith in Christ alone is the same for everyone, unconverted people have many different reasons for their unbelief, which need to be dealt with in different ways. And at the outset, people need to understand the true nature of conversion before they can ever be persuaded to seek it. So he begins with chapter one, mistakes about conversion. And here, Elaine explains what conversion is not. And at a time when England considered itself a Christian nation, there was a popular misconception that everybody was a Christian. Nearly everyone attended the parish church and was christened there as infants. And many falsely believed that the sacrament of baptism regenerated you or made you a Christian. Elaine proceeds to show that no one is saved by these things or by moral righteousness, education or any kind of superficial change or partial reformation. Chapter 2. The Nature of Conversion. And this is a wonderful chapter. And to borrow Spurgeon's words, as you read these pages, Surely the wind is blowing from the glory quarter. If you're truly converted, it will warm your heart and challenge you to a greater love for God. If perhaps you are unsure if you're really converted, it will help you to examine yourself. And Elaine describes the changes that conversion makes in a person's life in this way. Now, the man has new ends and designs. Now he intends God above all and desires and designs nothing in all the world so much as Christ may be magnified in him. He accounts himself more happy in this than in all that the earth could yield that he may be serviceable to Christ and bring him glory in his generation. This is the mark he aims at, that the name of Jesus may be great in the world. Reader, 
Elaine asks. Is this the language of thy soul? Chapter 3. The Necessity of Conversion. Elaine explains that this is meant for those who have a complacent hope that they'll be saved without any change of heart or life. And he goes on, Were it a matter of indifference, I would gladly let you alone. But would you not have me concerned for you when I see you ready to perish? As the Lord liveth before whom I am, I have not the least hope of seeing your face in heaven except you be converted. I utterly despair of your salvation, except you will be prevailed with thoroughly to turn and give up yourself to God in holiness and newness of life. God said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Never did any, nor shall any, enter into heaven by any other way but this. Elaine gives his readers five compelling reasons why conversion is necessary, showing that without it, all our being, hopes and religion are in vain. The only remedy, he says, is that thou must either turn or burn. He appears, appeals to people as reasonable beings. Dare not to run into the flames and fall into hell with your eyes open. But Elaine beseeches God for help. Lord, save them, or else they perish. Lord, have compassion and save them out of the burning. Chapter 4. The Marks of the Unconverted. This, says Elaine, is for those who vainly deceive themselves that they are converted already. And he continues, few deny the necessity of new birth in words, but they have a self-deluding confidence that the work is not now to do. Nelaine identifies the various marks of the openly unconverted, those who scoff at religion and brazenly practice gross sins. Beloved, Elaine warns, God hath written that none such except by converting grace shall ever escape the damnation of hell. But Elaine also warns that there are many respectable people who pass for good Christians, but who bear the secret marks of being unconverted, such as a reliance on an outward performance of holy duties, trusting in their own righteousness, or too great a love for pleasure and the things of the world. Elaine asks, Reader, does nothing of this touch thee? Art thou in none of the aforementioned ranks? He begs them to examine their own hearts, bringing the word and conscience together, and resting not till you have put the business of your eternal welfare out of question. Chapter 5 The Miseries of the Unconverted Elaine writes this chapter, he says, for those complacently sleeping in their sins, with no sense of the danger they are in. They need a spiritual wake-up call. And this chapter is not an easy read, but it's not meant to be. Elaine himself observes, I think this should be a terror to an unconverted soul. But Elaine knows that only God can reach those dead in sin to convince them of the fearful misery of this estate. You might expect this chapter to be devoted to the sufferings of hell that face the unconverted, but this is only one part of a wide range of miseries, present and to come, that all stem from the fact that while we are still in our sins, the infinite God, with all his attributes, is engaged against us. Elaine asks, are you a match for such an antagonist? And in the light of all this, Elaine pleads, hold open the eyes of conscience to consider this, that thou mayest despair of thyself and be driven to Christ and fly for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope 
that is set before thee. And continues, Awake, awake, O sinner, arise and take thy flight. There is but one door that thou mayest fly by, and that is the straight door of conversion and the new birth. Chapter 6. Directions for Conversion. And this is the culmination of everything that Elaine has written so far. And now he wants there to be no more delay. He sets out the means whereby those set upon turning may approach God. Follow but these few directions, he says, and if you do not then win heaven, I will be content to lose it. Whereas Baxter has 10 directions in the call, Elaine has no fewer than 16, beginning with a realisation of the need for conversion, the misery of our present state, a meditation upon the sinfulness of our sins and the inability of recovering ourselves, followed by a renunciation of those sins and a solemn choice of God as our portion resigning all of ourselves to him and taking the laws of Christ as the rule of our words, thoughts and actions. Elaine instructs the making of a solemn written covenant between God and the soul and then directs, Open thine heart to the Lord in these or the like words, supplying a six-page model prayer that takes the form of a marriage covenant. And this bears no resemblance to the brief prayer, sometimes called the sinner's prayer, which often appears at the end of modern tracts. And Elaine gives no assurance that if a person repeated this prayer, he's now a Christian. And Elaine is careful at all stages to stress that true conversion can only come about through God's enabling grace. And another slightly unusual inclusion in this chapter is a short soliloquy for an unregenerate sinner, in which the sinner addresses his own soul before turning in prayer to God. And finally, chapter seven, motives for conversion. And Elaine's insatiable desire for souls is demonstrated by him giving some further motives for conversion, even after a chapter where he's already explained the means of conversion. He says, Beloved, I am loath to leave you, but I would see a covenant made between Christ and you before I end. And Elaine has a remarkable gift for conveying spiritual realities. And no more so than here, as he supplies some final positive inducements, describing the rejoicing of God and his angels over the conversion of a sinner. Once more, Elaine prays for God's help in his last attempt. As a fisher of men, he's fished all night and caught nothing, but he pleads, Lord Jesus, stand thou upon the shore and direct how and where I shall spread my net, and let me so enclose with arguments the souls I seek for that they may not be able to get out. Now, Lord, for a multitude of souls now for a full draught. He begs the reader, O oh, sinner, return and live. Why shouldst thou die when life is to be had for the taking and mercy should be beholding to thee, as it were, to be saved? Asking, will you go on and die or will you set upon a thorough and speedy conversion? Now we come to point four, the impact of the book on some of its readers. The final words of the alarm are Elaine's prayer to God. He says, And though I should never know it while I live, yet I beseech thee, Lord God, let it be found at that final day that some souls are converted by these labours, and let some be able to stand forth and say that by these persuasions, that they were one unto thee. And many people over the centuries, I'm sure, could testify to that prayer being answered in their lives through reading Elaine's Alarm. So let's start with some modern readers. 
And as you might expect, there are very polarised opinions um, to reading the alarm from modern readers, probably depending on their starting point. One reader in 2020 only gave it one star, saying, This was one of the most stressful and difficult works I have had to read in my entire life. Whereas in 2021, John Benton wrote, This is one of the clearest, heart-searching and heart-warming explanations of true Christianity you will find. A review of 2011 by someone that I'm guessing is an American declared, this is the cream of the Puritan evangelistic crop. A good biblical jolt in our modern spiritual myopia might be exactly what we need. It's kind of like being handed a big steak and potato meal after a lifetime of eating Twinkies. You may not know what to do with it right at first, but you'll soon find it very satisfying. Note, Twinkies are an American snack cake with creamy filling, apparently. But going back a few centuries, we've heard about the mass circulation of this book amongst the poor, but it was read by all sorts and ranks of people in society, including Olaudo Equiano, a converted African former slave, who recalled in 1790 being given a Bible and Elaine's alarm while aboard ship. Up and down the country, copies of the alarm could be found in prisons, schools and libraries. When William Langley, a yeoman farmer from Ashby de la Zouche, founded a school for the poor in 1695, he specified that the alarm should be prescribed reading for all the pupils. Many famous ministers, such as George Whitfield and C.H. Spurgeon, read the alarm, along with Baxter's call, and paid tribute to its influence. In the last lecture, we heard of how Spurgeon's mother read extracts of these books to her young children on Sunday evenings, pressing them to seek the Lord. Spurgeon was convicted while reading the alarm prior to his conversion as a young teenager, but it only served to increase his sense of guilt. It was like sitting at the foot of Sinai, he said. John Wesley also thought highly of the alarm, including it in volume 24 of his 50-volume Christian Library of 1750, which, in Wesley's words, contained extracts from and abridgments of the choicest pieces of practical divinity which have been published in the English tongue. Wesley also adopted Elaine's idea of making a solemn covenant with God, and he used some of Elaine's words in an annual covenant service, held on the first Sunday of each new year, where Methodists renewed their commitment to God. John Brown, a Scottish Presbyterian minister, who came from a humble rural background, recalled his earliest spiritual stirrings at the age of about 12 in 1735. He wrote, The reading of Elaine's alarm to the unconverted contributed not a little to awaken my conscience and move my affections. Some of his hints, made worse by my mind, however, uh, occasioned my legal covenanting with God. Indeed, such was the bias of my heart under these convulsions that I was willing to do anything but to flee to Christ and his free grace alone for my salvation. And it seems that for Brown, as well as Spurgeon, slavishly following the alarm's directions at an early stage of conviction merely resulted in a greater sense of bondage. In a 1745 letter, Brown elaborated on his young experiences. After a formal slight using of Elaine's directions for conversions, I dedicated myself to the Lord in solemn vow, as Elaine directs, summer 1735 or 1736. Particularly, I vowed to pray six times in the day when I was herding and three times when I was not herding. In this way of doing, I continued from that time till June 1740 at least, still putting my fashion of religion 
in Christ's room, setting up my formal prayers, etc., for my Saviour, yea, for my God. However, John Brown was later converted by free grace alone, rather than his own efforts. And in fact, in later years, included Elaine's alarm and Baxter's call at the end of a list of helpful reading for his children. But he counselled, beware of some legal directions in the last two. The alarm also received frequent recommendations in sermons. Two examples of this. The first of which was delivered in Leicester by a man called John Green on 1st of January 1713 to a group of young people. In this New Year's Day sermon on the text of Proverbs 23:26, My son, give me thine heart, Green urged his young hearers to give their hearts to God, saying, It may be proper to do this, not only in heart, but in words. And as Mr Elaine and others advise, it may be very well to do this in writing also. Subscribe with your hand a deed of gift of yourselves to God, and keep it by you as a memorial of what has passed between him and your souls. The second example comes in a sermon entitled The Conversion of Sinners, the Greatest Charity, preached by Henry Venn at St Peter's Cornhill in London on the 19th of November 1779, to a meeting of the Society for Promoting Religious Knowledge Amongst the Poor. Ben speaks about the value of freely distributing helpful books amongst the poor. Books, he says, chosen with admirable judgment, which speak to every man's conscience in the sight of God with a voice of thunder, laying open to the bottom, without fear of offence, the misery vileness and certain damnation of all who to the last despise God and his Christ and their own souls. After this full and faithful warning, they plead, they expostulate and with fervent prayers entreat God to make effectual impression upon the reader that his soul may be saved, manifesting a degree of love very rarely to be found in any religious writings. This I may affirm with great truth of the Reverend Mr Richard Baxter's call to the unconverted and the Reverend Mr Joseph Elaine's alarm. Great glory from God rests upon the unanswerable pleadings for his cause, which these two servants of Christ have left behind them. Many, touched by the truth they have written, have yielded themselves to God as alive from the dead. And in 1782, the Society for Promoting Religious Knowledge received a letter from one of its subscribers who gave out gospel literature in the villages around Hull. She wrote, Mrs A. Howard desires to acquaint the Society that she's received yesterday their donation of books with pleasure. It is hoped good may, through a divine blessing, arise from their distribution which will be among the ignorant and poor, residing a good deal at Sutton, a country village, where an opportunity of disposing them to the needy and ignorant will not be wanting. I thought those bit books more particularly adapted to the cases of secure, careless and unconcer unconcerned souls, such as Baxter and Elaine's are, would be probably in the hands of God most useful. And then, um, finally, in, the, in this section, because the alarm was published after Elaine's death, we have no letters written to the author um, testifying to the impact of the book, as there were for Baxter's call. However, by looking at annotations written inside individual old copies of the alarm, it's possible to discover some of the people who once read it. My own copy of the 1678 edition includes an inscription on page one, recommended by Mr Hall to P. Booth, 1685, which highlights again how many people read the book after a minister had recommended it, either personally or in a sermon. Another copy 
this time a 1705 edition under the title A Sure Guide to Heaven, is inscribed. Anne Thomas's book, given her by her uncle, Dr Llewellyn, 1773. And this shows how the book was often given to children as a gift from relatives. And it looks as if this same volume was later passed on within this Welsh family. As in different handwriting is recorded, Evan Phillips, 1790. But we learn far more about the reader's thoughts in the third example, a copy of the first edition which once belonged to the Shropshire nonconformist minister Edward Berry of Bolas, 1616 to 1700, who was a friend of Matthew Henry's father. And inside the front cover of Edward Berry's copy is inscribed a poem composed by Berry himself in praise of Joseph Elaine, entitled I sell all in hope. And this poem shows the regard in which contemporary nonconformists held the alarm and summarises the book's message. Here's the poem. Joseph Elaine, I sell all in hope. When that a man removes to dwell where all things needful are, he'll sell all that he hath in hope to find elsewhere what will content his mind. So Elaine, hoping to speed well, not some, but all for Christ did sell. His health, his wealth, his liberty he lost, and for his sake did die. And while he lived, his cross did bear, and now he's dead, his crown doth wear. Edward Berry. And our final example comes from the Scottish Highlands. And the story is told that, towards the end of the 18th century, the minister of a Highland congregation, a man more eminent for scholarship than evangelical fervour, was approached by a society to translate the alarm into Gaelic. The book was thus passed into his hands, and finding it suitable material for the pulpit, he commenced to repeat the substance of its successive chapters to his congregation. The result, it is said, was a widespread awakening which long prevailed in the district of Netherlawn. Fifthly and finally, by way of conclusion, five lessons for us from Elaine's alarm. One, it inspires us to love sinners more. Elaine demonstrated genuine love for his people during his parish ministry and he did not desert them after his ejection, even though it meant a prison sentence. And because congregations loved their former pastors for remaining true to them, Elaine told his fellow ejected ministers that, never had you such an open door for doing good to souls, advising that he that has the people's esteem and affections for the Lord's sake has the directest way in the world to their hearts and the fairest advantage possible to serve God's interest upon them for winning and furthering souls. Two, it rebukes our shallow views of conversion. Elaine defines conversion as the thorough change, both of the heart and life. It is a deep work, a heart work. It's not, he says, the repairing of the old building but it takes all down and erects a new structure. Elaine will not let us be satisfied with anything less than a complete change, not an almost Christianity, conviction without conversion, or a mere assent to a statement of belief without a resulting sanctification of life. Three, it spurs us on to greater urgency and zeal. Elaine believes in the eternal reality of hell as he prays and pleads for sinners to be converted. Tell me not of hereafter, I must have your present consent, he writes. If you be not now resolved, how the Lord is dealing with you and wooing you, much less are you like to be hereafter, while these impressions are worn off and you are hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Why should not this be the day 
from whence thou shouldst be able to date thine happiness. Why shouldst thou venture a day longer in this dangerous and dreadful condition? What if God should this night require thy soul? Doesn't it make some of our present day offers of the gospel seem a bit casual, as if conversion is an option that people can merely think about at their leisure? Four, it challenges our use of time. Elaine achieved so much in his short life because he devoted every day to the Lord. He had been taught to number his days and he lived in the light of eternity. Let's remember what he said to his wife each morning. Here is one more day for God. Now let us live well this day. Work hard for our souls. Lay up much treasure in heaven this day, for we have but a few to live. And five, it causes us to rejoice in our salvation. Elaine describes the change conversion makes in this way. Before conversion, the man made light of Christ, minded the farm, friends, merchandise more than Christ. Now Christ is to him as his necessary food, his daily bread, the life of his heart, the staff of his life. His great delight is that Christ may be magnified in him. Before, he found more sweetness in his merry company, wicked games, earthly delights than in Christ. He took religion for a fancy and the talk of great enjoyments for an idle dream. But now, for him to live is Christ. He sets light by all he counted precious for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. O oh, happy man, declares Elaine, if this be thy case. Thank you. And I hope that you will join us again on Monday the 28th of February 2022 when, God willing, we will have our first lecture of the new series on the Great Ejection of 1662.